Thanks again for joining everyone, um, our Space to Grow session, all on preparing your business idea today, um, with a real focus on making those um, good er early ideas great. Um, so I'm joined today by uh, Nissan Patel and William Miller, um, who are both actually our entrepreneurs in residence at the university and um, give their expert advice to um, businesses who are looking to raise funding. Um, so if you are a business and you're looking to come onto our Angels of Essex platform, um, these are the two guys that you, you'll be speaking to who will help guide you through um, that process and improve your pitch deck. Um, so just a little bit about myself and the programme in general before we start. Um, so my name is Josh Clark. I'm the Business Support Coordinator at the University of Essex, overseeing both the Angels of Essex um, equity investment platform and the Space to Grow Investment Readiness Program. Um, so the Angels of Essex uh, platform is all about um, putting business ideas in the shop window for investors to be able to um, see those deals and hopefully invest in them. And the Space to Grow Investment Readiness Program is um, a whole series of sessions like the one you're in today um, to really help give you the knowledge and understanding whether you're a, an entrepreneur or investor um, about preparing for investment. So today's session um, is part is also in collaboration with Backing Essex Business. Um, so uh, that is an investment readiness program um, um, offering support, a free or uh, all free support to businesses um, in the Essex area. And this um, this session today is part of that program. And we'll touch on a few other programs um, uh, supporting at the end as well. Well, my background is that I've got a degree in electronic and electrical engineering. I've got a PhD in signal processing and an MBA. Um, I started off lecturing at Queen's University in Belfast in both computer science and electrical and electronic engineering. And then I moved to BT where I worked in, I think, all divisions of the company, ranging from doing research into speech processing, speaker verification, early work on artificial intelligence, through to putting stuff that we had developed into the network, um, moving on to work in the architect's office, looking at our systems and systems system strategy and finally being the architect for um, the energy management systems in the business. So through all of that, I've uh, run large teams, prepared business cases for support for new products and services, launched them into the network and uh, done various roles like that. I left BT about seven, eight years ago, have worked as a business advisor for the New Anglia Growth Hub since then and have been an entrepreneur in residence here at the University of Essex for the past what, 14, 15 months. So just, just to start off, uh, we've got the agenda there. And just before I go through that, I'll just give you a little bit of background. My background is a little different than Bill's in terms of uh, educational uh, length. Uh, I have a degree in manufacturing from the University of Bath. And I also have a master's from the City University in Manufacturing Systems. Over the years, I've been involved in uh, operations in large scale businesses like General Motors, building factories around. Uh, and more recently, I've been involved in running businesses that uh, we bought from uh, sort of receivership, uh, which are really great brands and developed products. So, part of the reason you know, I'm involved with this with Bill is both our companies over the long period would have been involved very much in innovation of existing products as well as new products uh, and one of the things we bring to the guys we talk to is the ability to understand hopefully that there is more to just uh, thinking of an idea uh, that will work and be be created into a business uh, so hopefully our backgrounds give us some ability to help you guys go through this let me start with the agenda today and basically uh, we've done similar webinars last term, but this is a bit wider and the context is really to open up to a wider audience in terms of starting businesses. So hopefully it's general enough for everyone who is looking to start a business to get an idea of what needs uh, to be considered prior to getting deep into starting up. So the agenda really is validating your idea 
is it a business proposition that someone will and is willing to pay for? Looking at the markets, the customers, who's going to buy from you? Intellectual property, one of the things we find talking to a lot of people uh, through the last year is understanding when they can patent something and when they should and when sometimes they shouldn't. Uh, and Bill will talk through some of that. Making it all work, which is a key. Uh, I think, you know, there's people who think the idea is a start of a business. Well, it's very difficult just with an idea. Making it all work is part about making the team, getting the idea off uh, the paper into something more solid, uh, and then finding all the relevant information and uh, attachment, including investment, uh, to get, get it up and going. And to do that, you need the team. And uh, we'll talk about how you know people sort of work together and also who's going to give you money. So that's about how you attract someone to invest in you. And just to take you through this side, I mean, you can see some of the key things and it's things that you probably have listened to and heard of from lots of people about uh, why a business idea is good or whether you should start it. But, you know, I'll pick a couple of things. Bill will pick a couple of things. But one of the things at the top there, do you really believe in this idea or is it something you're doing uh, because you think it's the right thing or it feels that you're in a position where you have other things that don't work? So getting yourself to understand and believing in the idea at an early stage is really important but it also needs to be realistic enough that maybe later down the line if you can justifiably change it or someone gives you some real hard decisions to make about the idea then you consider them so i wouldn't sort of 100 percent say look i believe in it so i'm just going to carry on now there's nothing wrong with that uh, and people probably have proved themselves right in a lot of cases in doing that but there's a challenge in that so just be reasonably balanced uh, when you sort of get to what your idea is and whether it's good enough to be into a business but generally if you believe in it then it's going to work so what the next stage there you know you can read for yourself but the other one i would say does the idea really provide a solution to the problem because most people will pay for things that will solve a problem. Uh, and that's really a key to innovative ideas because sometimes people don't see the problem and someone who can actually bring a solution and also explain why that solution is going to help with a problem are the guys who generally get a project up and running very quickly, they get a good following uh, and it sort of really helps take off uh, the sort of following for people. So there's, a few things there that you know hi, I would highlight, as I said, and the final one for me uh, is why will it work? It really, you really need to sort of get some detail done pretty early about what, why will it work? How is it different? What's out there that may compete against? Bill, do you want to pick up some of the other stuff on there? A couple for a couple for me, and I'll just pick up that last one that you said. Why will it work? I think the other one is why won't it work? You know, make sure that you understand the reasons why it might not work. And to do that there, you may need some critical friends who are going to speak to you and tell you, well, it will not work because of this or for whatever reason. You don't want to have lots of people around you who will tell you it will work and then find out later that there's some fundamentally something fundamentally wrong with it that will make it not work. I used to work for a guy and he said, if you're going to fail, make sure you fail early in the process before you've invested a lot of money and time and effort into it. So nothing wrong with failure, do it early, learn from it. And I think the other thing, the other question is, why are you doing it? Uh, some people will say, well, I'm doing it to make money, but that's money is the outcome of another reason that you're doing something. So you may have a particular you know, problem or cause that you want to, to solve and that's why you're generating this solution to this problem that you've identified. So the, the why you're doing it is an important um, question to ask yourself. So if, we, if we've asked a lot of those questions and answered them, we do need to find out some information about the market that we're going to sell to. And it seems an obvious thing to say, but you do need to have customers to buy what you produce. And therefore, you need to know as much about them as you can. 
So some questions that you'll want to ask around that would be, who are they and uh, what do they value? And sometimes it's very useful to define your ideal customer persona, which allows you to focus your attention. And by customer persona, it could be for an individual, you could be uh, wanting to sell whatever it is you produce to, uh, for example, a millennial, which gives you their age group. Uh, you want to, yeah, they want them to have a graduate, be a graduate of the university, so they're qualified at that level. They may have a disposable income of £2,000 per annum or something like that. Um, they like to participate in sports. They rent a house, but they would like to buy it. And that gives you a, a view of what that person is like that you're going to sell it to. And that then focuses your attention on them and you gradually build up more information about them. Could be that you're uh, selling a product into a business, maybe it's a software product and you're selling it to a software development house that employs uh, five, five or more people. Uh, they're innovative, they use uh, agile development techniques and, and things like that. So you can build up a persona for a business as well. And then when she, once you start to know about your customer, then you can find out where they're going to get information. And that's important because that will inform your marketing channel, how you're going to get information about your product to them. So you could be selling something into the construction industry, uh, construction industry made up of architects and surveyors and um, builders. So where do they get their information? It's probably true to say that they don't get a lot of it from uh, Facebook but they may get from LinkedIn, uh, they may get from hard copy uh, trade magazines, or they may get it from digital magazines related to the industry. So once you start knowing who the customer is, then where they get their information, that informs how you're going to do the marketing. And then it's important that you understand what the benefit is that you're providing to them, because that you convey that in your marketing message. And then you need to understand why are they going to buy from you because that then will inform your sales strategy. So um, you know, imagine that you developed a, a new travel cot for a child and it's made out of new materials, which makes it light. Uh, it's got some very clever um, design in it that allows it to be assembled relatively quickly. And um, it looks good, but those are all features of the product, but the, the parents probably won't buy it unless they know that uh, the child's going to be safe in it and going to sleep well. So from your perspective, you're thinking of all the features, but from the parent's perspective, they're thinking of other things, other emotional things that uh, they would use to make a decision. You know, people say that uh, people buy on emotion and then justify it logically later on. So you need to understand that side of things. Market sizing is important if you want to grow a business. Uh, now, some people set up businesses and they don't really want them to grow too much. They want them to keep them uh, to the level at which they can control and manage them. And that's a kind of a lifestyle business and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're wanting to grow a business, then you need to understand that there's a market into which you can grow. And the other thing about the market itself is what is the competition in the market? How crowded is it and how easy is it for other people to enter that? So what barriers have you got that prevents them from entering? Well, I just want to pick up the last two, really. I mean, you know, market size is very important. You know, trying to enter a market that's very small sometimes can be very beneficial, but you really need to understand it really well uh, and the customers in it. Going for a big market, you know, there'll be a lot of people in it. Sometimes we see charts where people say, well, it's a massive market. I only want 1% of it, and it becomes a big number, which is even harder to sort of, get up and running because if it's that big and that easy then everyone will be doing it so really understand the size of market and break it down to understand where you are going to provide the value to anyone who wants to buy from you the other one is competition and this has been sort of experience from my background is you know a lot of businesses always sort of struggle when the competition comes along partly because they start off with a very innovative, very creative new idea, but they forget that down the road, if it is that great, then people will come along and see why they can't get a piece of it. So it's also important once you've sort of got the base of your idea outlined is how you keep it refreshed and also how crowded the market is 
in terms of similarity to anything you're doing. A lot of people, particularly early stage startups, always assume that uh, what they're doing is new. And I think uh, I work with a colleague of mine at the Judge Business School, and he always says whenever someone tells him that, that he can bet them that if he searches the world's internet databases, he'll find something that's very close to it. So you've just got to be careful in terms of understanding and selling that uniqueness. But most people will have something unique, which is why people will buy it, but understand it and focus on it to deliver that to the market. This slide we're sort of talking about how you can get more detailed information about the market, um, about the size and how to segment it and competitors and that. So there's two types of research that you can do in your market research. There's primary research, which is work that you've done. And then there's secondary research that's been done by somebody else, which you can pick up and use. So primary research is usually about surveys and questionnaires, and there are applications that let you do that, such as SurveyMonkey or LinkedIn polls or Facebook polls, or you may want to buy uh, email addresses uh, of particular uh, types of businesses or their phone numbers, and typical costs for those are about 15 pence per email address or 5p per phone number. Or if you've got a lot of money to spend and you think it's valuable to do it, then you could commission a market research company to do that. But generally startup businesses don't have that money uh, to, to um, spend on doing market research, they have to do it themselves. Um, secondary research you can get from the, the good old internet, uh, you can Google for reports from trade bodies and local authorities and what have you, or the government also provides lots of data for free. Uh, you can get data from Companies House and you can get data from the uh, Office of National Statistics and they all come for free and they're available online. Um, but, you know, remember that in doing that market research and deciding whether you've got a market there, it's only part of your decision making process and you've got to add your energy and passion into the mix to make it all happen. Well, that, that's a good point to start on. I mean, I, I in my uh, role, used to tell people that we can't just design by numbers. There's so much data out there that you can analyze it and get yourself to believe that you've got the right piece of idea, right uh, product. But it's also important that you have that creative touch and an element of surprise, because if it's not different to what's out there, then why are people going to sort of come and have, at least have a look at it? So it's a good tool to help you understand where you should be placing your product, whether what you've designed will stand the sort of market needs through information that you can gather. But it's always down to the business creativity and the innovation to stand out in, in that sort of market. So use it, but don't always rely that it will give you the answer. And here are just some examples of those uh, things that we talked about. So on the left, uh, here's a specialist, rep specialist reports that are available for this company and they look into the leisure market and they'll provide reports on the customer types, on the sites, market data and so on. Now those you have to buy, but they are available and there will be specialist companies who will provide lots of that information at a cost to you. But nipping over to um, what's available from the government, uh, if you look at Companies House itself, each business that's registered there provides a lot of information about it. So it will provide its registered office. Uh, here you can see in the middle that the, this is in Colchester. Uh, you can see when it was incorporated here it's 21st of August 1990 so that gives you an idea of how old it is and right at the very, very bottom you can see the nature of business or the SIC code classification. So SIC codes are standard industry classification codes and that's how UK government um, um, analyzes and categorizes the economy. So each business when it's formed has to provide a SIC code for it and there are over 600 individual codes. Some of them are very specific. So there's a code for the manufacture of wallpaper, for example, um, but then some of them are very general. So you've got a code for other cleaning services, but that data is all available for free in downloadable form in different uh, Excel spreadsheets. 
So if you had somebody that could analyze the data, you can find, you can search for businesses of a certain age, working in a certain industry, working in a certain geographic location, for example, that'd be all free to you. And then from Office of National Statistics, they provide a range of, of data sets. And I've just picked out one, homeworking in the UK labor market, because that's kind of topical at the moment, who, who works at home. And this gives you a classification by industry, occupation, region, age, sex and ethnicity and you can download all of that and use that for your analysis and then for a trade body uh, the an example here is, is the society for the motor manufacturers and traders and they've got some data on car registrations at the bottom and the changes over a year and so on so there is lots of data available uh, for free and if you can't find it for free then you may have to to buy it but also go and look at in the libraries as well, because sometimes libraries will contain uh, this kind of information as well on the bookshelves. Just one thing, I think just make sure what whichever data you use is good data, because what you don't want is to find that you've built your sort of strategy around a lot of data, then you find that it isn't as valid as you thought it was. And as Bill said, you know, this is available to everyone. So everyone else can see it as well. So you've got to pick something unique out of that data that enables you to do something different and provide something different. So as I've said previously, you know, data is there to help you, but not give you the answer. So just make sure that you pick the relevant data for you uh, and the sort of answers you're using that for is also mixed with your own deep knowledge about what you want to create as a business. Here's a couple of examples of uh, products that have gone into the market, uh, no doubt after somebody's done some research on it. The one on the left is the one that always intrigues me, and that's the Razer phone. Uh, so that's a mobile telephone which has got an inbuilt Razer in it, so you can apparently have a shave while you're using your mobile phone. Why anybody would want to do that is beyond me, but the product was launched uh, by a Chinese uh, manufacturer back in 2009. But as may not surprise you, it's no longer available. I kind of think that at that time, Motorola was producing the Razer phone, spelt R-A-Z-R, and somehow or other the Chinese manufacturer got the wrong idea, but that's just my interpretation of events. The more important um, thing is, is uh, Red Bull. Um, so Red Bull is an example of how you can create a market where it doesn't exist. And this is sort of a classic uh, textbook case study. The company, the drink was found by an Austrian toothpaste salesman in Thailand and it had been developed in Thailand to keep people who drank alert and awake. And he thought, well, there might be a market in that in Europe because there's a market for that in Europe because there's nothing like it in the market. So they brought it back. But because it was a small company, they had no marketing budget. But they decided that the people they would market it to would be uh, young, mostly male people uh, who were interested in extreme sports. And so they had this guerrilla marketing strategy where they identified their target customers and then they went and sort of hung out with them, gave samples away uh, at nightclubs, at sports events and concerts. And then they, uh, they've gradually moved to sponsoring events. So you can get uh, Red Bull, uh, BMX, mountain biking, surfing, snowboarding, kayaking, skating, F1, uh, sports events that are all sponsored. The, probably their biggest uh, event was the Stratus uh, jump from the edge of the edge of space, which was a 24 mile free fall event shown on 80 TV stations, uh, uh, 50 countries around the world and 8 million uh, online viewers on YouTube. Um, and that was a three hours long event. And as a result of that, their sales rose by 7% in the six months afterwards and 13% in the 12 months afterwards. So they never talk about the product, but they're all, the product is always associated with that kind of sporting event. Um, it's all, it's uh, extreme, it's on the edge, it's what people like to be associated with uh, as well. And the, the strap line is Red Bull gives you wings. And I know they were sued because it, uh, they didn't give you wings, but um, that's still the strap line well known. And these maintain the biggest share ever since they began in 1987. I think they still hold over 40% share of the marketplace. So you can, if you're clever, 
create a market where it doesn't exist. Most of the time, people will be entering a market that does exist. So just on the opposite to what Bill said, uh, the other way to sort of look at failure is not responding to the market. And you'll see the car market there and the marquees that actually didn't respond through the period. Uh, and really, th this is about getting people to think at an early stage because the cycle now is shortened in terms of product cycles. So you've got to look as well as introducing what's coming around the corner and where things are going. And, and this is quite a complex slide in trying to tell you why the reasons behind it uh, and the whole sort of change of the motor car and the size uh, and the engines that we all drove uh, had a lot of things that sort of resulted in the changes. But generally, there were some key things that uh, drove them and, and you know those things actually apply to most products particularly when you're looking to direct consumer sale uh, and that's what this is about that you know if you have a, a good product doesn't mean that it's going to take you through the cycle uh, of the world's changes that we've faced and this is a period of what 50 years uh, on that slide alone and I bet a lot of those car companies have struggled very hard through that period. Uh, and it's also about history. You know, a lot of startups don't have any history, but companies who are going through growth may have some history uh, and they've got to really understand how this sort of fits into where they want to go, because it's always a challenge uh, when you've got something existing and it works to sort of think about when it needs changing. Uh, and this is just really getting into context that some of the time the failure isn't down to what you can control but it's down to what you can't control but being able to sort of pick that up at an early stage and start addressing it so and just just to emphasize the point the cars um have got you know sort of uh, that was a 50 year life cycle with uh, changes taking place probably every decade but here's one that's quite topical and changes are happening in months so Peloton, which everybody will know probably because of their massive TV advertising campaign, uh, brought out the, you know, the exercise bike and since then has developed various other products associated with it. But early uh, in January, um, primarily driven, I think, by COVID um, and the lockdowns, the, the company was selling lots and lots of uh, exercise bikes. But... Uh, because there was a huge demand for it, the difficulty then meeting that demand. And uh, the problem was then they get, they get bad feedback as a result and lots of complaints. And there were lots of uh, social media uh, um, platforms that were carrying those complaints. So they had a product, they advertised it well. Uh, then, as it says there in the middle, the, um, the Peloton, the idea grew faster than Peloton, the company. So you've got to be careful if you're setting up a company and you've got something that will sell well, you've got to be able to scale up to meet the demand. But now they're facing another problem in that um, the lockdown has stopped, people are going back to gyms and therefore sales have fallen and now they've had to cut the price. Of, of the bike, the signature bike, by uh, hundreds of pounds. They've also got new entrants into the marketplace. There are lots of different ones coming in now, uh, you know, Echelon and Nordic Track and Swift. Some of them have beaten them out for a while and have been buoyed up by this uh, Peloton type wave. Um, we've even got an artificial intelligence uh, exercise bike, which sort of uh, understands your exercise regime and can adjust the programs accordingly. So that's a step forward again. But it just means that if, be careful when you put something in there, uh, plan for success, because if it does take off, then you've got to be able to scale to meet that success. But you've also got to be aware of what's happening around you in the marketplace, because you can be impacted by changes that are outside of your control. Well, the key to this is, you know, they, they spent so much money on marketing uh, and the grow, uh, the strategy of growth that uh, one, they didn't understand how quickly it would grow and where they needed to be from an operational point of view. But on the other side as well, that, you know, something that happened outside of their control uh, has totally took the sort of business backwards and, and how they deal with it. Uh, and it's very hard to sort of preempt this, but now we know that, as we said before, that the cycle times for product development, the world changes much quicker than it used to. This has to be part of the entrepreneur's tool as he's sort of looking at out 
and more so important for companies who are looking to grow for a, a period of uh, stability? So now, now we've reached the point where we have uh, an idea, which we believe is a good one. We've got a market that we understand and that we can sell into. So if it's a good idea and it's a good market, then what will um, prevent other people from uh, attacking you in that marketplace? So you want to make sure that nobody can copy your idea. And uh, this is where you start to think of um, what is what it is that's unique about your idea and how you relate to the competitors. And you want really what you're producing to be different from everybody else. Now, if you can find those differences, then you need to consider, can you protect it in the marketplace? And the way that most people think about protection is uh, whether they can patent it or not. Um, and that creating a patent describes your idea and publishes it for, uh, for others to see. So therefore you might choose not to patent it if you don't want other people to see how it is that you, you do whatever it is that you're doing. So you might want to keep it a secret, in which case it's a trade secret and you'll protect that in other ways. And you need to be careful that you don't share those uh, trade secrets with other people. So you'll use things like non-disclosure agreements to prevent other people uh, to picking them up and using them, or you'll build it into your contract of employment such that people don't disclose the trade secret in the um, uh, to other people as part of their job or when they move on. Uh, part of the painting process is that it costs money and it does take a time to do that there. So it can take 18 months you know, before it gets first published. So you might decide, well, um, I, don't, I don't want to spend the money on it. I want to uh, make better use of my money. I've come across people who are in startups and who have got a good idea, but they spend maybe four or 5,000 pounds patenting it, but then they can never get it into production because by that time they've run out of the money that they have. So again, you might choose not to do it for that reason and make better use of their money. Or you might decide that, well, it's too soon to patent it. I need to work further through it and um, get it to a stage where I can um, make a good, strong patent uh, surrounding it. So um, you may then decide that if I'm not going to patent it, I am going to move quickly in the marketplace. So I'm going to get in there, I'm going to build my brand, I'm going to establish it, and uh, others can come along after me, but um, it'll take them a while to be able to copy me and I'll be able to grab a, mark, a bigger market share and I'll deal with the competition as I go along because I'll be able to refine my product, add new features and get them into the marketplace as well. Um, although we've majored on patents, don't forget trademarks, um, which you can register, you know, your logo and your name, uh, registered designs and copyright. And if you want to know more about all of those, then look at the uh, information on the Intellectual Property Office website. Uh, and if you also go to the IPO, the Intellectual Property Office, they do have advisors who can give you some advice online for free. And just scroll down to the bottom of that page, you'll find a phone number that you can phone and they can give you some free advice, um, which because it's a specialist area, you'll usually have to involve, uh, you know, a, a patent attorney or a trademark uh, attorney to take you through the whole process of creating the patent, creating the, the registered um, trademark. Uh, but even those organisations will give you some advice um, for a limited time for free before taking you further on a, a journey to create the intellectual property. Trademarking and sort of property, intellectual property is becoming more and more of a strategic part of a startup business. Uh, because I think, you know, as, as Bill said, if, if you sort of got an idea and you are working through it, uh, then you can't introduce it because you don't want it to be sort of going out in the market until you've got your patents in place. So it sort of slows it down. Uh, and the other side of that is you want to get to market quickly as well. So you've got to really think about the benefits. But more complex businesses, and I, I sort of talk about deep science businesses or you know uh, businesses where you're doing some real deep research, will need patents to to get grant funding. So it's a balance between you know how important the patent becomes and how quickly you grow your business from an early stage and also how protected it becomes and how valuable it becomes. So 
it, it's a subject that's hard to sort of give you the answers to in a conversation like this, but it's also a subject that you can't forget, particularly if you're doing something very innovative and something that's sort of very different to the market to ensure that you get all the benefit of your work. You, you might say, but I'm not in the business of creating, creating patterns. Uh, or anything like that. But here's a couple of examples that show that IP issues can happen to anybody. So on the left, if anybody comes from Ipswich or the surrounding area, they'll recognize the Applaud Coffee Shop, which is in St. Peter's Street. And that was set up by two sisters, Hannah Huntley and Beth Cook. And they launched a company called Baker and Barista in Ipswich in 2013. But they didn't know there was a contract catering company, which was based in Surrey, which already applied um, to trademark the name Barista and Baker. So you can see the similarities there. Hannah and Beth's shop was called Baker and Barista. The other contract catering company was Barista and Baker. So two years after they had been set up, the sisters got a letter from a firm of patent and uh, trademark attorneys, which said, please stop using your name because it's too similar to our trademark. And uh, there was nothing they could do about that. So they had to close and rebrand itself to applaud. So after, after being in business for a couple of years, then they just had to simply change their name, which meant that the, the brand loyalty that they had built up had been uh, lost over that two year period and has now moved to be uh, under the name applaud. Um, they could have, if they uh, decided to, but they, because again, you know, they did it completely innocently, they could have gone to the trademark um, database and searched to see if there was anything like that name, and then maybe decided not to use the trading name Baker and Barista because it might have been too close to Barista and Baker. So that's small coffee shop in Ipswich that's run into a trademark infringement issue, which cost them money then of rebranding. I should also say that other coffee shops are available in Ipswich. Another one is the this one on the right, which is a Cambridgeshire a family run farm, which uh, created a drink called Pure Oaty. And there's a large company called Oatly, which is a Swedish based giant, um, and it sells uh, its oatmeal product uh, globally. And it then said that this Cambridge company using the Pure Oti name was infringing its trademark. And it said that it was infringing the registered trademark and the packaging was similar. So therefore they wanted them to stop uh, using that. But the judge decided that any similarities were at a general level and therefore the Cambridge company could carry on using its name Pure Oti because he decided that it wasn't confused with the Oatly name. So you can see that um, you can run into these trademark infringements, um, you know, accidentally and very innocently. So it's worthwhile just spending a bit of time just checking out uh, the trademark that you've got or you're planning to use. Make sure it doesn't infringe anybody else's or is close to it. Think again if you think that it does. But then you can also register your trademark as well to protect, protect it for you. Uh, and again, that can be done. Um, you can do that yourself or you can get a specialist um, law firm to do it for you to make sure it's all done correctly. Well, I mean, the Oatly one, a lot of people would have understood there and, you know, it was fairly initial, but they actually had to spend quite a significant amount of money uh, to actually get the uh, results on their side. So, yeah. you know, again, it's one of those that if you believe in what you're doing, then you've got to stand behind it. And they actually got probably the money's worth out of the advertising that uh, was created behind it. Uh, yeah. And the guys believed in what they were doing. So it's always that challenge. Okay, so, I mean, up to this point, we've been talking about all the sort of thinking you've got to do behind deciding when and how you start a business. Now we've got to talk about how we are going to make it. So once you've decided you've really got to start understanding what it is that you need to create. Uh, if it's a piece of software, then you've got to work out who's going to do that. If you don't have the set of skills yourself, you've got to work out whether you're going to source it locally, source it abroad. You've got to look at the cost side of it. Uh, and so making is probably, in my opinion, nearly 70% of a business. And when I say making, it's about all things that 
create the actual operating model for the business. Uh, it's not just in its sort of physical product sense, like a product uh, car or a radio. Uh, but the thinking behind it is the same. You've got to really have a process in place so you can monitor how things are happening. You've got to be able to control the changes that you're making to these things so you know exactly at what point the product worked, what point it changed when you changed something. Again, if you look at the sort of change we've had because of COVID, there's a big impact now on relying on outsource, particularly abroad. You know, a lot of people in its early days, uh, particularly where it may, it was concerning a physical product, would say, well, I've got a design, I'll get it drawn out locally, and then I'll have it manufactured in China. Uh, and that has really changed now, partly because of what's happened, partly because, you know, the le length of time it takes just because of the situation. Now, you know, those things may go back uh, and people will again say, well, that's the right place and the right source. But I would suggest that in today's world, with the tools around that are available, you can do a lot of it under your own control, particularly at an early stage. So you've actually got the benefit of knowing your product inside out yourselves while you develop it. And then you can sort of outsource the mass manufacturer or change it to suit uh, as it sort of progresses into the real world of the marketing uh, and have to develop different product ranges. So that's one thing. Outsourcing of software is sometimes even riskier than outsourcing solid product manufacture uh, because it's in a, a bit of an ads. I know it's getting much more structured with the tools around today. Uh, but again, for an early stage business, that's probably hard to sort of follow that type of development, uh, partly because of cost, partly because you have to rely on sometimes people will do work for you, not necessarily your choice uh, out of the sort of market. So it's important that you actually work out what is the best way for you to get the making of everything that you need to get your business up and running. Uh, the two other things there are about whether you launch one product or do you have a number of products that you can enhance? Uh, how do you support the product in terms of once it's out there? Uh, and do you do some big trials? So it's quite complex, but it's very hard to not do and get it right. So I would suggest that when you have really thought through the process of setting up a business, if you don't have the set of skills to get it operationally up and running, then you start looking and find a colleague, a partner who can give you some serious advice in this. The team. So this is where we're starting to move away from the, the idea itself, but um, figure out how we're going to execute the idea. And it's the execution that builds the business. So there's no such thing as a solo entrepreneur We'll, we'll make that statement. Some people may decide to, to uh, argue against it, but in reality, there's only so far that a solo entrepreneur can take a business if you want to scale it. Um, by that, I mean grow it, because there comes a point when the single entrepreneur can no longer keep control of everything that's going on within the business, no matter how good they are. They may know a little bit about everything in the business, but they want to bring in other people who have probably got more expertise than they have in certain areas. And that's where you need to understand what it is that you're good at as an entrepreneur and what you're not good at, which is just as important. And then you've got to find real people that fill in the gaps as you grow. And that's probably the hardest thing for an entrepreneur to, to do is to let go of their baby that they've um, given birth to, that they've nurtured for a while, and now they're going to hand over parts of its uh, growth to other people and so you've got to really um, think about that when the right time to do it is and understand uh, the best way to do it so finding and retaining the right people is always a challenge it's difficult finding them and retaining them may also be difficult as well um, but sort of a general rule uh, is not to build the team for the startup phase you really want to build it for the scale up phase because you want people who are going to be with you during the growth phase and then be able to scale that business so they're going to understand where the business has come from 
where the gaps are that will uh, not make it be successful and they've got to be able to fill those gaps in. The other thing to say is when you're recruiting people, it's always there's always a tendency to recruit people of a similar mind and thinking to yourself. But really, you want to employ uh, some people with um, different ideas to you, as long as you can manage them and as long as they can buy into the reason as to why you are doing what you're doing in the business. Because if you've got diversity in the team, it will always lead to new ideas. They may not always be successful ideas, but they will generate new ideas and stop you becoming stagnant. And then the important thing is understand the personalities in the team as well, not just their technical skills, but also how they work and how they operate, how they relate to each other. And ultimately, ultimately, you are the leader of this team. So you've got to be able to build it, control it, manage it, take it forward and take the business forward with the team behind you following along. So if we sort of look at who will give you the money uh, to get your teams and business ideas up and running, there's a number of ways, you know, families and friends help early stage startup. Finding a grant is another way of doing it. And then looking for equity investment, crowdfunding. And one of the things that early stage startups don't necessarily look as an option is debt. And we can sort of understand that. But sometimes if you've got some revenue coming in and you want to hold on to your business, then it may be a way to look at it. So you can see there, if we go to the next slide, Bill, we can sort of talk about how that would, right. So this is a slide that goes through creating a pitch deck. And when you create this pitch deck, uh, you can see the sort of subjects that need to be covered. Uh, and this will be part of another webinar we'll do deeper. But as you can see, to get people interested in investing in you, whichever form of investment you get, you have to be able to get the story across to them. Uh, and we think, you know, there's 12 significant points that every deck needs to have for that to be able to understand why someone else who doesn't know the business doesn't really want to know too much other than it's going to be successful, particularly if he invests in it then this is a format that has worked well for us. If I just pick a couple of things on, on the list, uh, you know, as we said before, understanding the problem, looking at the solution are the two key things at a very early stage of the pitch deck because those two things will decide whether people look further down that deck uh, or not. Uh, and it's very hard to actually convince people that uh, there's an investment opportunity unless they can clearly and simply understand the problem you're resolving so of the points there i would say you know the first two for me if i was investing would be very important yeah i think well i think understanding again the market opportunity and is there a market for it is one that i would pick up and i think also really the current status you know where are you at on your journey is an important thing to understand because people can uh have done some fantastic things, but they don't actually tell it in the deck. Um, um, and, and you only find out about it when you ask them some questions about it. So presenting that to, to let people know where they're at. And yeah. just, just a point on that, so we can sort of move a little bit, is when myself and Bill do the talking to people who've got a deck, they're not very good at telling us what they've already achieved, because that makes such an easy decision for an investor to say they've reached certain points and a lot of them are positive. So be careful that you really understand your current status and be proud of what you've achieved. Mm. Sorry, Bill. Yeah, no, I was going to say that they, finally, the information that we've put up there is for a deck, the same information you need for a business plan if you're looking for debt finance or you need much of the same information if you're applying for a grant. Um, may be presented in different forms and it may be less emphasis on one rather than the other, but being able to create and produce that information is important. A lot of talk is about grants. For startup businesses, it's usually difficult to get a grant unless you're going for something like an Innovate UK grant. Um, sometimes people think grants are free money, but that's because grants don't have to be repaid, but they're given out to uh, meet a specific objective. And if you don't meet that objective, then the grant can be reclaimed. 
Um, a good thing about getting a grant is that it helps validate your idea because the grant application will be reviewed by peers uh, who are experts in the area. Um, and there are EU grants, national grants, regional grants, and in some cases, local grant bodies as well. Um, and you get a grant uh, after you've made an application, it's assessed, and then you'll be awarded the grant. You usually have to spend the money before you can reclaim it. And they always say, don't apply for a grant because it's there. Uh, make sure that you apply for a grant if it fits with what you're doing. And just a little note at the bottom, if you are doing anything that's innovative, uh, involves science and technology, look at R&D tax credits, because that's the way government gives money back to business and paying uh, corporation tax. People say that Innov uh, Innovate UK grants are hard to get, but this is an analysis of uh, grants that were awarded with start date in 2020. And you can see that down the east of England here, there are uh, lots of businesses have received grants from Innovate UK. And the majority of them are micro or small businesses. That's businesses employing uh, 10 people or less. So the grants can be can be got uh, and awarded to, to small businesses. How do we contact the likes of William and Nitin? Okay, so... If you're interested in um, more information on the Angels of Essex pla platform, um, if you email, I'll put it in the chat, uez at essex.ac.uk, um, we can assess your needs and see whether we can um, put you on the list for a one-to-one -one with William and Nitin, um, and we, we will be able to help, your, help you improve your pitch deck and get ready for investment, and then hopefully um, join the Angels of Essex equity uh, investment platform as well. I just wanted to say that um, there is a lot of uh, fully funded support out there, um, and which means it's free to the business. And so there, are, here's a list of organisations in Essex that you can contact. Uh, Banking Essex Business, the university itself, um, Colby, which is Colchester um, Business Enterprise Agency, a best growth hub. Now, every um, place in, in England will have a growth hub that you can access. So if you're not in Essex, then look for your growth hub for your area. And they're usually the single point of contact for business support. Essex County Council offers a range of support and the South East Let offers a range of support as well, all accessible through those links that are there on the screen. If you want more information on these similar lines, you can, of course, um, email us at uez.essex.ac.uk. So I've just put that email in the chat there. Um, or please do feel free to um, have a look at Backing Essex Business and have a look at the services that are available for free there as well um, within the Essex County. How do you know if people will, will pay for your product and what they would pay? So how would you go about pricing? I think that's a, a very interesting but a very difficult question because it really depends on what are you providing to the guy in terms of your value. Uh, and that goes back to some of the early things we talked about, knowing the market, what's in the market, and how you differ. So, you know, you can get a good idea of what you should price it at based on knowing those things uh, and then pitching a price that either gets you lots and lots of volumes like Palaton try to do uh, and be ready for that success or gets you a value that you know a certain part of the market will come to you, the other won't. So it's, there's no easy answer uh, other than knowing you know, your real uh, market definition of where your product's going to sit. But we can sort of help a little bit of that uh, on an individual basis, because obviously from our experience, we sort of know a little bit about where certain products sit, but it is really knowing the market and knowing your competition and providing a different answer to a solution they may already exist and providing your solution is more efficient for people to use. It may also be in the marketplace where there is a sort of an existing accepted sort of pricing model, you know, for software as a service, you know, that's on a subscription basis with no capital outlay. So it's based on a price per month, you know, per seat or per um, volume, data volume or something like that. So you may have to fit in with an existing model 
um, but as Netna says, then you have to work out the value that you're providing and, and price it on the basis of value, or, or you can go back the other way and work out cost plus margin. Uh, so cost of production, then you want some margin on the top of that there and you price it that way. So there are different pricing models applied to different markets. And as Nick says, difficult to work out an exact number, but you can get a view of what other people are charging as well by doing your market research. And our next uh, webinar in this series will be on the 19th of October. So please do keep an eye on our website, our mailing list um, for the information on that one. Thanks for coming. And uh, I hope you have a good afternoon. And one final big thank you to William and Nitin, uh, William and Nitin for doing a great job again um, on the presentation.